All right. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Happy Friday. Um, thank you very much to everybody for tuning in today. Um, my name is Michael Redhead Champagne, and I'm joining you today live from Treaty One Territory, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Winnipeg's North End. Today, I'm excited to welcome you all on behalf of Canadian Urban Institute's uh, Spotlight on COVID-100 in our country, 100 days after the World Health Organization has declared this pandemic. And so today, what we're doing is we're having a spotlight on the prairies in the north. We have a number of folks that are joining us from uh, a number of different places across this vast expanse. Before we get started in introducing folks, uh, once again, my name is Michael Redhead Champagne, and I'm a regional lead with Canadian Urban Institute, and I am a community organizer, a public speaker, and a mentor to young people here in Winnipeg. Um, the work that we're going to be doing today and the conversation we're going to be having together is related to the work that we're all doing in our different corners of the world, uh, different pieces of municipalities, and we have a superstar team of folks that are assembled here today. I want to draw everyone's attention uh, before we get started, anybody who's uh, watching, uh, take a look at covid100.ca. It's the website for Canadian Urban Institute talking about all the stuff today. There's a few things I want you folks to support that has been released about what's out. Oh, there it is. Uh, it's in the uh, chat there. Um, you can take a look at uh, the COVID100 website uh, in which uh, there will be details about all of the talks that have been happening today but also a really neat feature called 100 Actions. So I want you to take a look at that and actions have been pulled from some of the work that Canadian Urban Institute has been doing in uh, connecting with different municipal leaders and learning from folks about how we've been responding to COVID-19. So please take a look at the 100 Actions and there's also the report that I wanna point out. But that's my technical stuff that I needed to get, uh, get informed uh, for all of you as we get started. Um, and our hashtag, of course, for the festivities today is COVID-100. So if anybody wants to follow along and have a conversation with any of us on social media, please do so. Joining us today um, on our panel, um, I will introduce uh, your name and I will let you introduce yourself in the way that uh, you would like to for about a minute and then we'll get started. So um, the very first person I'd like to introduce is uh, Rebecca Alti. She's the mayor of Yellowknife, and uh, she's going to be joining us a little bit later. A little bit later, and so folks are uh, please don't be surprised when all of a sudden we have Yellowknife's mayor jump in on the call. Um, next, I'd like to acknowledge and welcome Pamela Golden McLeod, the director of emergency management services at the city of Saskatoon. Welcome. Hello, everyone. And I'm um, very excited to be here and uh, very excited to be part of this conversation. And when someone said it was, you know, 100 days since um, WHO declared a pandemic, um, we're in Saskatoon, we talk about COVID time and it seems to be a little different. COVID time moves much faster than regular time. And, um, you know, in my role, I work with um, our in internal city of Saskatoon supports and our external critical infrastructures and all of the sectors that are responding to COVID. And, and um, like every other community, everyone is responding to COVID. There is nobody who is not impacted by this. So I'm looking forward to being part of this discussion. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you so much. I also want to welcome uh, Marcus Chambers, uh, city councillor here in Winnipeg, uh, recently was the deputy mayor, recently appointed to the Winnipeg Police Board, uh, among many other things. Marcus Chambers, welcome. Good afternoon. I'm so honored and excited to be part of the discussions today. Uh, as a newly elected councillor that uh, I've been here now since 2018, uh, to be part of this uh, pandemic where we've now seen quite a shift in terms of our traditional roles in the community uh, as city councillors or elected leaders, uh, how that's changed and how we've had to overcome so many different obstacles, even in uh, uh, the normal course of governance and, and providing services for our citizens. So it's been a very interesting time. It's been a, a, a very much a time of learning and uh, it'll be interesting how, how history writes, how responsive Canada uh, and each of our provinces and cities have been through this time of crisis. So I'm, 
I'm very interested in uh, furthering the discussion this afternoon and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, everybody's input today and, and how I can bring that back to my council members. Thank you so much, Marcus. Um, I also want to introduce uh, a duo, a dynamic duo that we have uh, right here from Winnipeg, Mark Head and Christopher Classio from InterCivics. Um, rock, paper, scissors, who wants to introduce themselves first? Mark, do the honors. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my name is Mark Head. I am a, um, I would say more of like a helper, like um, I guess translation for that word, it means a volunteer. So I'm, I'm a person who, who helps the community or helps groups um, whenever they, you know, uh, whenever they need it. Um, but I'm also very excited about this, um, this, we this webinar on this specific topic and sort of sharing our, um, uh, a civics perspective of it, right? Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing a lot of uh, fruitfulness from this, uh, from this webinar. Yeah. Chris, take it away. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm Chris Classio, a helper in the community, just like Mark, but I also ran as a school trustee back in 2014 and actually tried running as mayor of Winnipeg in uh, 2018. And so civics is a passion of mine and just want to learn and engage more citizens. I think that's one of the things that I feel like COVID-19 uh, has taught us is after it's all done is how do we communicate city hall and citizens? That's my big uh, concern. Thank you so much uh, to all of you uh, for being here. And thank you. Shout out to all of our viewers right now that are uh, participating and watching us on the webinar and participating on social media. So I wanna get started with a, a very broad question. Um, I know that COVID-19 has, uh, it's been a hundred days. It's been a hundred days. And it has affected all of us um, very, very differently. And I know that the, oh, ah, thank you very much. I see uh, one of the commenters says, hello from Toronto. Uh, anyone who's watching right now, uh, send in the comments uh, where you're watching from so that we have an idea of uh, the regional perspectives that uh, folks are kind of tuning into. Who loves the prairies? Who loves the North? Tell us where you're from. Anyway, um, I'd like to just uh, give folks uh, an opportunity to say um, a little bit about, um, uh, briefly, uh, what your work was um, and how it has been altered very dramatically, I would imagine, by COVID-19. I know that for myself, I'm a public speaker and a community organizer. A lot of the stuff I do is bringing groups together and trying to hash uh, things out together. I have not been able to do that with COVID-19. So I've become zoom, 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 zoom uh, every day. And so that's uh, been a big change for me, but it's the adaptation that I had to make. So um, what I'll do is I'll pass it to, I guess I'll just pick on people. Uh, maybe I'll pick on Pam first. Pamela, if you're all right, um, letting us know a little bit about um, what is your work and how has it changed uh, since COVID-19 has come into this situation for you? So I think, you know, um, I'm the Director of Emergency Management for the City of Saskatoon, so my normal job is responding to complex and escalating emergencies and building plans and um, building partnerships to help us respond to emergency situations. So um, I think I'm one of the few people that this is my work. This is what um, we normally do, but how we've done it is different this time. Um, normally when we talk about emergency management, you know, we talk about emergency operations centers and those are typically big rooms with lots of computers and lots of people having conversations and uh, working together in incident command structure. And of course, that's not doable in this. Um, you know, we, we started out that way, but now like many people, we are working from home and um, we are having to adjust to use technology. And um, that's been a big change for us. And it's been a really positive change. One of the things we know in emergency management is when emergency situations happen or disasters, we want to build back better. And we want to look at, you know, how can we um, learn from what we've done and um, come out stronger. And I think in so many ways during COVID, our community will come out of this stronger, deeply impacted, and there will be long-term impacts, but we've learned a lot. Um, I think one of the things that, um, that we've adapted is, you know, 
who, who's involved in emergency response. And so in the last five to 10 years in emergency management, um, it's really moved from the people in uniform solving all the problems to a whole community approach. And when I came into that, this role, that was one of the biggest and most important tasks I found was, you know, who hasn't been part of it and who do we have to include? And so we've luckily built relationships with our business partners and um, with other community members. And of course, residents are always at the forefront of this. But I think, you know, one of the adaptations we've made is we have engaged sectors that haven't traditionally been involved with emergency management. And we will continue to engage with those sectors as we come out of this. And so that ad adaptation has been important for us. And I think um, it comes down to relationships and we are continuing to develop those relationships throughout this event. And I think in Saskatoon, we're lucky in that we're two degrees of separation away from anybody in Saskatoon. And so if there was a sector that we weren't connected with, we were about one person away from getting strongly connected with that sector. And so I think that's been a significant adaptation for us. When we look at our EOC, normally you look around an emergency operations center and you see a lot of people with love bars and stripes on their shoulders. And when I think about this response, what I see is a lot of people um, who have been engaged in a different way in this work and who are essential moving forward and will always be part of our emergency management now going forward. So those are our big adaptations. And um, we've, my family's had to adapt. I think all of our families have to having me home and around. And I think my biggest concern coming out of is I have a three-year-old lab who is now used to me being home all the time. And when I'm not home all the time, it'll be interesting to see how he adjusts to that. So. Well, thank you so much, uh, Pamela. That's super helpful to learn about all the great stuff that's happening. You, um, I also noticed Rebecca Alti has joined us. Rebecca, I just want to take a moment and uh, welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us, I believe, all the way from Yellowknife, since that's where you're the mayor. Um, do you want to maybe take a, a minute and just introduce yourself to folks? Yes, thank you. And uh, sorry for the delays uh, or the tardiness for arriving, but uh, the back-to-back -back Zoom calls. Um, so my name is Rebecca. I'm the mayor of Yellowknife. We're located on Chief Dry Geese territory, home of the Yellowknife's Dene First Nation. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing from others. And I can't believe it's 100 days into COVID. It, it feels like it's been years. I can't remember February, but at the same time I can. And um, yeah, we, we've definitely had a uh, some interesting challenges, opportunities, and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, I guess basically the question that we're at right now, Pamela was able to answer it first about um, what was our work before COVID and how has it changed? So uh, maybe we'll move to Marcus next to maybe tell us a little bit about what's happening at the city of Winnipeg level. Um, has COVID-19 changed everything for you or what's happening in your world? Yeah, certainly when uh, the World Health Organization announced the global pandemic, the city of Winnipeg was in the midst of passing its four-year multi-year budget. And um, I had taken uh, a bit of uh, vacation time just before we were to engage in our uh, departmental or standing policy committee discussions. And while I was away, of course, um, the World Health Organization did announce and uh, I received uh, uh, messages and calls from our mayor saying that everything had changed. Up until that point, Manitoba did not have any confirmed cases and I believe it was on March 12th where we had our first confirmed case of COVID-19 in the province and it really changed the course of history for, uh, for us going forward. If I can say historically going forward. But um, yes, it's certainly uh, in terms of the discussions that we had to have uh, that uh, uh, reflected what our budget would be, not knowing at that point in time what the impacts would be in terms of how long businesses, schools uh, would, would have to be closed, uh, what the impacts would be to our citizens. And again, um, since the isolation or self-isolation uh, has started and the social distancing, it's really had an impact on, on mental health, I would say of everybody. Um, 
such a strong sense of um, you know isolation, uh, especially for our seniors. Um, we've had to go through personally. Uh, my mother-in-law um, was in hospital and has now left hospital and is now in a senior's home and had to go through a week, uh, sorry, two weeks of self-isolation before she was able to even uh, roam around in her senior's uh, facility. So again, that, that whole self, uh, sense of self-isolation and, and um, not being able to be in the public domain has had quite an impact on, on individuals. It's had an impact, obviously, on businesses. Now, as we're starting to ease those restrictions from a provincial health directive, um, there's still the sense of social distancing that's required to ensure that we're not spreading the virus. We've, there's been so much change that's happened over the last, even the last three weeks. Uh, we had here in the city of Winnipeg a rally on the Black Lives Movement two weeks ago today. Uh, thankfully, there have not been any cases, new cases directly uh, related to the rally that took place where over 20,000 people participated. So I'm very yeah, thankful. I was going to say, isn't that like 20,000 people and no confirmed cases? That's no tough. confirmed cases out of that. So Manitoba has been very lucky. It has been a result of uh, the citizens here taking this very seriously and doing their part to self-isolate, uh, to use hand sanitizers, to social distance. Uh, so we've been very fortunate. So hopefully as we're moving forward, we can be one of the provinces that will be the shining light that, uh, that shows and demonstrates what happens when people are following the provincial health orders and uh, being socially responsible. Thank you so much, Marcus. That's really helpful for us to have that understanding of, of what's happening at the municipal level, right, in Winnipeg, and things are different. Um, Mark, maybe I'll ask you first um, to tell us a little bit about what is InterCivics, um, and then maybe we'll go to Chris for answering the part about how has COVID-19 changed everything. So, oh. Mark? Yeah. Or you uh, guys can switch. I mean, answer both if you want. Uh, do what do you would um? Oh, what's your feeling on that, Chris? Would should I do it, uh, or should we split it, or should we say it here? Uh, Mark, I think it the idea of intercivics actually came from Mark. I joined in afterwards. I think he should have first in what intercivics is, and I can add to uh, the discussion on what intercivics is and how it's changed with COVID. And, right, uh, right. Okay, well, um, InterCivics, uh, super briefly, um, InterCivics was born from um, observations of, uh, of conversations and groups and, and, uh, and mainly those, type, those two things. Uh, I noticed that uh, a lot of people knew a lot about issues and specifically politics, right? Uh, but they didn't know necessarily how uh, beyond sort of the very bare minimum basics of what governance is like right civics and, and all that and uh and so i kind of saw that i kind of saw that blind spot and and i thought well you know maybe it's time to sort of you know somebody should at least try to fill it and uh and, and so i took it and uh and from that um i i kind of wanted to sort of like uh it sort of sort of wanted to advocate sort of like the basics of civics, but then it kind of grew into, as I had more conversations with people and, 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 and Winnipeggers that, um, you know, it, it should be something more. And I think that um, starting out, it was meeting a lot of people and asking kind of like, feeling the pulse of like, you know, what is their knowledge that they know of, you know, what civics and, and, and what politics are and the differences and, you know, asking those questions, right? It was very, gradual and uh, kind of so I thought okay well um, I don't want to sort of determine you know right away what this should be I think I should sort of kind of build on these conversations and sort of like uh, defined inter civics that way and so far um, kind of what it has kind of come to now is uh, um, inter civics is a group that um, looks at um, citizenship, it looks at uh, 
services. It looks at solutions. It looks at uh, uh, so building people's system literacy and how to understand how municipal things operate, basically. Basically, yeah. Um, it's still evolving, and kind of that's where we're at. Thank you for okay. summing that up much quicker than me. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, um, that's what that is uh, right now. Again, it's still evolving. Um, Chris, what the, what how does this impact? Uh, just want to play back on what Mark was saying. Uh, Intercivics comes from two words, uh, inter interdependence and civics. Uh, interdependence means in our uh, understanding is how does city services uh, match city administration with city councilors and with the mayor system. So things like how does governance uh, work interchangeable, interchangeably and how they depend on one another. And, and as well as citizen engagement. Uh, and the things that has changed for me and Mark is the lack of meeting face-to-face -face with citizens and the lack of uh, supporting local businesses. Uh, we usually met with uh, uh, city clerks in uh, Grace Cafe at City Hall to talk about what does civics look like in, uh, in the city. And so it's been a frustration for me and Mark to connect to person and to learn and build a strong relationship within the community uh, on that topic. So one of our frustrations is the lack of uh, person to person uh, uh, relationship building and the supporting local businesses in the community. Thank you so much. Um, that's why I really love the work that you and that Chris and Mark both do. Um, the activities all happen in locally owned businesses. And I think that's really fantastic to be supporting our local businesses, even if we don't got that much money. Um, Rebecca, uh, maybe we'll move to you now and ask you the same general question about how has COVID-19 uh, affected you? Um, and, you know, like, I mean, obviously you can't speak for the entire North, but you can maybe let us know uh, insight into how Yellowknife has been affected and how things have changed for you. For sure. And I was just talking to the mayor of Whitehorse over in the Yukon yesterday. So we were sharing a lot of similarities. Um, so we've been fortunate in that we, well, uh, you know, we had a very quick and aggressive response right from the start from the territorial government, which is the lead department or the lead government. Um, so we've actually only had three cases of COVID in Yellowknife. The first was on March 21st, the last was on April 5th, and everybody had recovered by April 20th. And of those three, nobody required hospitalization. Um, but again, it, it came because of the quick border closure, so only residents from the Northwest Territories could come in. Um, businesses were really proactive in shutting down and trying to go onto those online uh, platforms and, and getting creative. But it's an unequal heart. There's definitely businesses who are in the PPE business who have, can barely keep up. There's the construction businesses now that are putting up all the sneeze guards. Um, but we had a, a growing and booming tourism economy, uh, particularly more so in the winter with Northern Lights, our, our big um, countries that visit our, our Canada, but also uh, Japan and China. So now with the uh, international travel down, the hospitality businesses will really will really struggle because our population is 20,000 here. We are anticipating about 128,000 tourists to come through. So to try to make up that difference is, it's a pretty big shop local, buy local campaign that we're, we're working on. So, um, so businesses were also really creative. You know, there was a, a spa in town that was doing online facials where she would drop off the product and then you would do a zoom and she would tell you how to apply it. So I thought there was a lot of creativity in that. Um, from a government, again, it's, it's easy to shut down and it's quite challenging to reopen. And so we're now in phase two of four in the Northwest Territories. And so we can open stuff like our, our field house where we play soccer and the walking track, but we do need all those, um, all those measures in place. And we're looking at the creative ways to, to deliver our services. So stuff like arenas won't really be allowed to be open until phase four, which is when 
a sufficient part of the population in the Northwest Territories has been vaccined, um, which is impacts hockey. And so, yes, we're Northern City and we're going to strive to to put out a few more outdoor rinks, but trying to get the kids up for hockey on a Saturday at 9 a.m. and it's minus 40 is going to be a challenge. So, you know, we're looking at what are those creative ways. It's, um, it's also, you know, we're really jumping into the digital age. We, we did do a lot of stuff online as a city. Our, our council's meetings were already webcast, so now we're doing them by Zoom, but we've got that digital divide. And when I think of the National Indigenous Peoples Day is on Sunday, and uh, generally we have a great, great fish fry and celebration here in our, our um, city hall. And that can't happen this year and, and Canada Day can't happen. And so, you know, you, you try to do these virtual events, but, um, and we offer free Wi-Fi here at City Hall out on the lawns. And so it's, it was definitely getting pretty tough in April because we're still, still pretty cold then. And um, it's not like you're going to sit outside in the snow and, and go on your Wi-Fi. Um, now that it's summer and it's nice, I think it's, um, and we've had some of these restrictions lifted. We're, we're all kind of exhaling, but the second and third wave coming and it being, you know, in the dead of winter, I think will be quite a challenge. So these restrictions are put in place to uh, eliminate COVID, um, but the flip side of the, the mental and physical health of residents is, is quite the challenge that we're gonna have to have to consider. And um, it's been interesting to see, you know, quickly we're getting the feedback from residents when stuff has been getting shut down. And I would say our, our number one facility is our solid waste facility, the dump. Uh, just nonstop emails asking when's it opening, when's it opening. And here in Yellowknife, we have a salvaging culture. So you are allowed to go to the dump and, and pick up something that was trash to one, but it's a treasure to you. Um, and that can't happen right now because the virus could last for 72 hours. So we are still thinking of ways of, okay, what about if this cell is the 72 hours and you kind of rotate, so now you can salvage in this area. So lots of, so much creative thinking on on how can we live in this new norm. Yeah, well, thank, thank you so much. Um, one of the things that I absolutely love about COVID-19, what am I saying? One of the things I love um, about this pandemic is it has revealed uh, at a municipal, provincial, and federal level the capacity that our governments have to respond to crises when they believe that something is a crisis. Now, for me, I'm First Nations. I'm from Shamadawa in northern Manitoba. Um, I work a lot with folks in the child welfare system. Um, and in Winnipeg, we have, uh, and Manitoba, we have a problem where there's an overapprehension uh, with child welfare, often related to poverty. Um, and this concept of family separation um, not only plays out in child welfare, it also plays out oftentimes in health when people are seeking supports for mental health or addictions. And it also plays out often in justice and policing. And so I know that in Winnipeg tonight, there's a rally um, for Aisha Hudson, the 16 year old woman, indigenous young woman who uh, lost her life to the Winnipeg police after an incident at the at a liquor store and so these are very difficult and pressing times and I know that the community was hard for us not to be able to come and support um, Aisha's family when that uh, initially happened but there's an opportunity tonight for Winnipeg to come together and so um, I say all of this because what excuses that used to be given have fallen away what have we learned from our municipalities or from levels of government um, that all of a sudden, if we can do it now, I feel like we've revealed our capacity to be able to do that at all times, to take care of our relatives who sleep outside, to take care of kids that are dealing with poverty. Um, so maybe, anyway, that's a little bit of a rant, apologies, but um, maybe we'll move to Pamela and, and ask you if you have any concrete lessons that you think you've learned um, that you wish others would be able to implement. You know, I think one of them is that, you know, um, in emergency management that 
um, disasters and emergency events disproportionately impact those who are marginalized or those who are living in poverty um, in particular. And, you know, we, as soon as um, we realized the impact um, in Saskatoon, we realized that our residents who are living in poverty or those who are facing housing issues are so disproportionately impacted by this. It's very easy for me to sit here and self-isolate in my suburban home and, you know, with all the resources I have, but for those who are homeless, for those who are, um, who are struggling, that is a far different thing. And so here in Saskatoon, um, we have a phenomenal group called the Interagency Response to COVID, which is 50 of our um, community organizations who um, typically um, do this work. And they've come together and um, they've actually come together and one of our emergency management um, staff members, Deb Davies, a shout out to anybody who knows Deb Davies, she has done phenomenal work. She has implemented an incident command structure with those 50 organizations. And I cannot say enough about what they've accomplished. Um, they have all worked together. They have identified the needs of this group. They have put resources in place. And, you know, I think when I think of what excuses, um, we have no excuses now that we can't work together, that there are jurisdictional issues or that there are, um, you know, um, siloed issues. We have to work together and we have done that in this situation, which means we can do it in easier times. If we can do it in the hard times, we can do it in easier times. And we can let those silos fall away. We can let those jurisdictional issues fall away and we can figure out how do we build back or how do we do this better? And I think again, we have been very lucky and I, and I, and I hesitate to use the word luck because I don't think it was luck. This interagency response to COVID they worked together, they um, put differences aside, and we have not had any diagnosed cases of COVID in our vulnerable population at this point in time. And, you know, we identified very quickly in emergency management that that was our biggest risk factor, that if COVID got into one of our homeless shelters, if it got into one of our food bag locations, that that the mitigation would be so much more difficult than if it got into another location where we can easily self-isolate, where we can easily physical distance. And so um, I think that's our biggest excuse is, you know, we can't work in silos. We didn't work in silos in this situation. We work together and going forward, that will never be an excuse again. We will well, always uh, expect uh, uh, we can do it now, we can do it in the future. Pamela, thank you so much. And I really, really love so much of what you said. Thank you for being so specific. Um, Marcus, did any of what Pamela shared uh, sound exciting to you? And are there any lessons that Winnipeg has for the rest of the country? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, a lot of it really resonated with me. I mean, amidst the COVID environment that we were all uh, faced with, uh, I know for myself, uh, and the ward that I represent is one of the low-lying areas in the city of Winnipeg. So uh, amongst the COVID environment, we were also dealing at one point with potential flooding along the Red River. So had to operationalize uh, dike building uh, for some homes that were vulnerable along the, uh, along the river. And what does that look like in a COVID environment where you're trying to procure volunteers to come out and assist you uh, that can't be more than uh, six feet apart from each other? Uh, and are, you know, schlepping sandbags back and forth to erect a dike. Uh, so uh, it's amazing that we can still accomplish a, a lot of what we did, even though uh, the provincial health directives were what they were. Um, as, as the snow melted and as we uh, moved into the spring and, and now summer months, summer uh, I believe is tomorrow, uh, we have our encampments, uh, again, a part of the city of Winnipeg. And uh, again, trying to monitor that from a safety perspective and uh, ensuring that as people are, uh, are homeless and how we address the effects of homelessness uh, and, and trying to uh, find uh, you know, proper housing, low barrier housing for individuals. Uh, and again, from a safety perspective, whether it's fires that could, uh, could happen, whether it's the spread of COVID that could happen, um, you know, these are the things that we still have to address as, as a city government. So again, um, a lot of what Pamela had, had mentioned does resonate with me that 
if we can do this during the time of COVID, we should be much more better prepared going forward when we can fully divert our attention and focus to the issues of the day. Yes, Marcus. I'm happy you're a city councilor in my city. It makes me feel relieved. Thank you. Um, so thank you for saying all of that. Um, Mark, um, lessons, intercivics. What, lesson, what lessons have you folks learned um, in the work that you've been able to do or not been able to do um, that you'd like to share? What, what would you like to see from your work maybe happening elsewhere? Um. Well, it's, um, what we have done was, um, I think very recently, I think late last year, we decided to sort of, because uh, we took it on one, I decided to take a one year hiatus on it, but I brought it back, brought breathed new life in it, and I was wanted to do things differently for this year, 2020. And uh, what do you know it? <laughs> the COVID-19 happened, and so it's Be like, careful oh, what you wish for, now, because it's really different. <laughs> Yes, it is. I can't even. Oh, I can't even go out the door. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, with that, it brought barriers to uh, reaching out to people because I know I wanted to do a lot of. It, the COVID has stopped me from 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 meeting people face to face, definitely, because that was. I really wanted to do more of that, getting out, meeting meeting people. Um, so what I've had to do, uh, and now me and Chris have had to do, is to rely on uh, the other um, techniques like uh, e emailing, uh, social media, uh, phone calls, all of the, uh, the non-face-to-face uh, -face methods of, uh, of communicating. Uh, it's been hard. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's been super, super, super slow. I'm sure everybody feels, feels that when it comes to even just work right so like what's a success that you've had um that you want other people like what do you do that you'd like to see elsewhere just everything what we do I, I guess what we do is is uh, is um you know i really like the the concept of civic engagement you know um meeting people uh, that are not necessarily in established uh, uh, groups or organizations and uh i think meeting people like just whether you're like um, somebody on the street, somebody in a public area, public square, uh, and and then starting a conversation, uh, creating that, creating those relationships, I think that's a good uh, solid foundation where to start. And I think we need to do uh, better at that. Not that like go back to the same old hello, goodbye, see you later, see you maybe some other day. Uh, it's like you know engaging them like. When meaningful to Toronto, like, to Toronto, 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 you know it's um i think it's uh you need to do things a little differently a little better in that in that regard and i think it's very indeed what i love about what you're saying what me? i love about what you're saying mark is um there's a humanity in the way that you folks are approaching your work that i think sometimes is lacking in municipal structures and emergency response and leadership in times of crisis. And um, I really appreciate the emphasis on relationships and the humanity that you Yeah, with. yeah. I like how you brought that up. Like too much, I think, in sort of uh, the, the working world, there's too much emphasis on professional development between human beings when we should start focusing on human development between human beings, you know, and the way we do our work with each other. So it's, uh, it's something that uh, I think we have opportunity to uh, to adapt to. So, yeah. What about you, Chris? What are the going, What do you wish for the world? Uh, going back to uh, the things that me and Mark used to be involved in the community, is like for example, meet me at the Bell Tower, which is a stop the violence rally that happens in the North End that hasn't been able to happen because uh, COVID nineteen has has made us separate each other from the elders in the community, from the little kids. And so building that relationship has uh, disappeared. And I wanna see more of that uh, coming out of COVID-19. We need more uh, spaces of, uh, safe spaces for young people during the evenings. Uh, another example of like, I find a beautiful humanitarian like kind of action is like Food Not Bombs at Beam at the Bell Tower who cooks for us uh, for uh, people with no access to food have been uh, getting uh, 
used uh, veg veggies and produce at uh, local uh, no frills. And so every Fridays, Wednesdays and Mondays, uh, they've been going to community spaces, handing out food to uh, people who don't have access to uh, food security. So things like that, we need more supports for food banks. Uh, yeah. Wow, thank you so much. That's, thank you, Mark and Chris. It's really great to, uh, to have your perspective. And I, on purpose, I'm happy to have you folks here because you're not the usual kind of suspects. Um, not to say the rest of you are usual suspects, um, but uh, maybe I'll stop talking and maybe go to Rebecca now and uh, ask if maybe there are some lessons that Yellowknife uh, has learned that they think the rest of the world needs to know a little bit about. My head is just going everywhere after everybody's comments. So I'm trying to like figure out that one. Um, I think the, the value of having your business continuity plan up to date, um, you know, I wouldn't say many businesses, especially the small businesses in town had one. Um, and so at the municipal level, we actually been working to update ours just it was in our work plan this year and all of a sudden you know it wasn't slated for March 2020 but um, it was going to wrap up by April or May and so it was just like boom accelerated so as much as um, we all want to like we've seen really fast changes the reason those have happened is because we're working long hours so that pace it will be tough to keep up. So I think that question of um, what's, uh, you know, we can't keep at this speed forever, but how can we bring it down, but still be, um, I think the, there's a, a book about ooching. So trying something and if it works going forward. So doing more of those risk and management um, to see the likelihood and the consequence and um, because we do get into analysis paralysis and not realizing that not doing anything has a consequence. And this is really showing like this paralysis. I never heard of that before. Yeah. We love to just spin those circles and it's just like, no guys, let's get out that risk registry. What's the likelihood? What's the consequence? Hey, let's, let's try this little thing. Um, there's also been, not at the municipal level, but at the territorial level, some pretty incredible pilot projects that have gone on, like a managed alcohol program, which was 30 days. And the research has shown across Canada that it's effective. And here in the North is like, yeah, we, we should get going on that. And it was just like, boom, they did it. It was a good success. However, there was no continuity. So um, one of the challenges I see is, is our budgets have gone into a lot of these emergency um, programs that had to be there. So what, what's going to be left for these great programs that have shown value for the, the long term? So it is, a, it's, I think, really shown us quickly, um, maybe we'll have different priorities in the future when it comes to, to budgeting, and we'll be able to make those, those different decisions. So so many different lessons and I think the, the big one that I want to to take away is also doing that debrief at the end to because we had some some interesting you know communication glitches between the different levels of government and we're finding stuff out through the media as opposed to the minister and so um, having a good debrief and then setting up our systems so that they work better in the future yeah thank you so much I'm so happy you mentioned uh, systems, um, because I think you're, uh, I love what you said, Rebecca, about how the pace that COVID has um, demanded of all of us is not a sustainable pace. Mm -hmm. um, late nights, weekends, uh, all day, every day, um, you know what I mean? Uh, and so it is not a sustainable pace, and that's why we have to think about um, how do we systemize some of these things that have been working well. And I just wonder about municipal systems across the prairies and across the north that maybe don't have such dynamic leadership as the folks that we have on this call today. I, I worry, I worry about our relatives that are in uh, isolated or rural communities that maybe don't have access to the same municipal structures and resources um, that we do. And I know that like 
Winnipeg has like the, the Winnipeg kind of regional municipal kind of area all around where we kind of, you know, we got our little neighborhoods all around us and we take care of them and give them water and stuff like that. Um, do you think that there's um, a bigger role as we move forward? Do you think that there's a bigger role for municipalities to kind of reach out kind of beyond or is that too, am I asking now too much of municipalities? I see Marcus. Yeah, no, and, and, and Rebecca, you've raised a really good point there. And I think uh, it's incumbent in terms of municipal leadership. And I know that, um, you know, over the course of the last little while, as I sit on our, our finance uh, standing policy committee, and some of the levers that we've utilized to, um, to kind of offset the cost uh, associated to, to COVID, uh, we have a, an emergency um, relief fund that we've been uh, that's been accumulating over these last few years. Our, our reserves, uh, and and just can't emphasize enough the importance uh, that a reserve fund provides in a situation like this. That we're not living paycheck to paycheck, so to speak, as a municipal government. That we have planned ahead and looked at uh, contingencies should something like this arise and just realizing how fragile our, our, our economies are um, as a result of something like this that that shuts down our uh, our businesses and uh, shuts down our way of life um, I wrote an article a little while ago uh, just indicating that you know if it were an, uh, a natural or a man-made disaster where people are tapping into insurance claims to rebuild and uh, replenish what they've lost through whether it's a flood or a fire or you know, man-made a war what have you uh, that it does stimulate the economy to some degree but in this instance all we've done is shut down our businesses and as a result some of our businesses may not be able to recover as a result which leads to less revenue and less income for municipal government so again it's important to plan ahead to be responsible in terms of uh, how we proceed forward that as a municipal government, again, we're not living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I see Pamela and also Rebecca, uh, maybe we'll let you guys respond. Well, I think, you know, one of the things you re referenced was that, you know, um, regional approach to, to these type of events. And I think what we know is that all emergencies are local. Um, they, they, the impact is felt locally and, um, and by individuals, but we've got to work together on that. And I think one of the things that um, COVID has taught us is, you know, when we used to talk to people about their emergency kits and your emergency go kit and what you needed, we talked about you need water, you need your medications, but what COVID's taught us, and I think we knew before, but it's really emphasized is we need those relationships. And so one of the things we've talked about is, you know, for the individual, that means what are your social connections? Do you know your neighbors? Do you know the people around you? Who depends on you and who do you depend on? That's an essential part of an emergency kit for an individual. But I think on a regional level, that's also an essential part of our emergency response is our regional emergency response. How do we work together on this? And how do we support those municipalities around us? You know, Saskatoon's uh, the largest municipality in Saskatchewan, and so we want to work closely with those um, those municipalities around us. And so we've developed regional partnerships, and we're in the process of, of building more of a regional partnership in emergency management. And this has emphasized that if we're not working together on this, you know, buying PPE is an example. If, you know, we're buying up all the PPE because Saskatoon's the biggest, we're impacting our partners around us. And so how do we work together on that? And I think more and more what COVID has taught us is that those processes, those procedures, um, those relationships are essential and we've gotta be doing that together. We can't be doing that in isolation. And so, you know, we've looked at those regional partners and we've included them in our EOC, those smaller communities around us, um, because the better informed they are, the better they're responding, the better it is for Saskatoon. That's where our, lots of our staff live. That's where our staff um, have their families. And so the better they're prepared, the better we're all prepared. And so it goes beyond just, you know, making sure we've got fire services, those locations. It's about 
how do we work together and how do we make sure we're not um, opposing each other and we're all feeding the same information up to our provincial and federal partners as well and the same requests up. Pamela, that also makes me think a lot about um, how do municipalities support local businesses and I think about things like social procurement policies that are you know possible to help direct municipal funds towards those local businesses or businesses that are owned by Indigenous folks or people of color. Um, anyway, uh, I want to let Rebecca uh, respond uh, and then let's give uh, Mark and Chris, because we're quickly running out of time. Oh my goodness, uh, Rebecca. Thanks. Yeah, no, I think um, this is really the relationship building between myself and, and the mayors. Um, particularly, there's um, four other major cities. Yellowknife is half the population in the Northwest Territories, and then we have 32 other communities. And so I'm one of the only full-time mayors, and so all the other mayors and chiefs are, are part-time. And um, so any resources that we can share, and we're not duplicating the resources, I think is important. And um, you know, a little plug to Municipal World's uh, daily news is um, looking in and seeing that we're not alone. We're all we're all in this together and being like, yeah, no, we're on the right track. Like this is what um, this what this jurisdiction's doing. And, and Marcus, I was following along with your budget, and because um, we had quite a quite a big issue coming forward to council, and so how are we going to deal with all people that want to come and, and speak? And I was like, well, Winnipeg's did this and they marked it out like that. So I think it's really looking at other jurisdictions, um, other municipalities, reaching out and sharing resources because we don't have time in an emergency to be doing so much of the, the same work. So anytime we can share resources. And I hope now to continue to build on that um, going into the future for, for other things. Wow, thank you so much. I think um, so much of this conversation um, is generating really great ideas that I would love to see implemented um, in different municipalities. I know often we have uh, pilot project syndrome. I don't know if that's a real thing, but it's like where everything has to be a pilot project all the damn time. And mm -hmm. we never actually learn from the pilot project to change the system. So, um, uh, are there any promising practices um, that you'd like to highlight? And maybe what we'll do is I'll, uh, with our final nine minutes, um, I'll, I'll let each of you um, share uh, your final thoughts. Um, and maybe we'll start, we'll go with uh, InterCivics, then we'll do uh, Marcus, then Pamela, and we'll finish with Rebecca. So InterCivics, right. last, last let me, comment. Let me share my first two cents on, the, on this topic. Uh, just talking about the Winnipeg uh, metro region, which is uh, 16 different municipalities of the metro region of uh, well, Winnipeg. I think we need to learn more about that uh, that that uh, that model because uh, we do have uh, the those 16 com community mayors meeting up and talking about what the regional plan is, and you don't you hardly hear about that topic being talked about during elections. And so learning more about the um, regional politics is very crucial in developing uh, municipalities going forward. And one of the resources that uh, the Winnipeg Metro uh, Organization, uh, they have a, a report called the Benefit for All. So if you go on their uh, website, you can find their report and it says uh, their plans for uh, going forward. So that's a good resource to look at. Thank and I, so I want to add to that. I, I want to add to that. Um, there is this. Uh, I just found this out last year, but and I think it might be something that uh, that other municipalities may have or may not have, but should be thinking about. I, you know, uh, we often when we heard when the COVID first came that we heard that the uh, uh, that we we heard the um, the first uh, I guess um, ex expert come forward from the province, which is called I think the officer of health or the some yeah something like that pardon me the provincial health uh minister or, or director health minister okay um, chief public officer chief yeah. public officer yeah. um and i've noticed that uh that that you know uh person is in charge of the whole province and that's including the city but um, in my uh, civics education, I looked under the city charter and I noticed that uh, there is an unutilized uh, 
uh, person or, or utilized uh, uh, something that the city can do city centric, like municipal centric. And that is, you know, it's able to hire its own uh, city focused uh, yes, medical health officer or well, I we think that's what it's called. Part of it. Jay Shaw, who's our emergency measures uh, director. So right. we have. Yes. Helpful. Do you do you want to add something there, Chris? Oh, why didn't we know about this earlier? That's one of my uh, frustrations about uh, uh, civic government is they should be educating uh, citizens about uh, key positions like that. So uh, that's just one of my. Uh, but now we know it and we cannot unknow it. So thank you very much, Mark and Chris. Um, and thank you, Marcus, for answering that. Um, I wanna give uh, Marcus, Pam, and Rebecca another opportunity as we quickly run out of time uh, to share any final thoughts that they have. So uh, maybe Marcus, we'll go with you next. Well, again, Michael, you did mention earlier the, um, I guess, silver lining to COVID and the fact that it's been a, a tremendous learning opportunity. One of the things that I've noted as well is that it, you know, as we be some of the restrictions and others are still in place, it has allowed a lot of families to come together to, uh, to kind of revert back to, to a more simpler time. And what I mean by that is the use of our active transportation trailways. So a lot more people have been using bicycles, have been walking, have been uh, outdoors in open spaces and utilizing our active transportation trailways, which has been fantastic. As a matter of fact, we've, as city councillors, uh, worked towards extending uh, the, the extension dates of our active, the, uh, active transportation trailways that we've enhanced uh, through COVID. So that's been one of the, um, I guess, silver linings uh, of this, uh, this recent uh, pandemic phenomena. I guess in closing, the other part of it is that um, our Grey Cup champion Winnipeg Blue Bombers will be champions again uh, for another year uh, and riding supreme over our uh, rider fans to the uh, west of us. Pamela, okay, well, to you. I, we'll see what Pamela has yeah, to say about it. <laughs> so yeah, Marcus, uh, way to throw down the gauntlet and you should know that my family um, has been longtime rider season ticket holders. My mom was a rider rep. Um, we bleed green and white, and uh, we'll take that challenge on. And I think our premier did note that the Bombers needed to open their practice facility earlier than the other CFL teams. They just need a lot more practice to get up to the same level as the riders. So, um, but <laughs> we will continue that conversation at some point. Um, I think, you know, for final words, I think it was mentioned in the chats, but I, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, has been referenced a lot is the mental health and wellness of our residents um, throughout this, this crisis. And I think that's something that for emergency management, uh, we will always consider going forward in one of those silver linings as we realize that that has to be part of our preparedness planning, that has to be part of our response planning is considering the traumatic impact and the, the mental health and wellness um, during emergency events. And um, we've definitely learned from that. And we've also seen, I think, what strikes me over and over again is the kindness and the way people reach out. And I think, you know, I think that's a prairie, you know, maybe it's Canadian, it's prairie definitely, and it's definitely here in Saskatoon is that constantly in our EOC, we have a sign that says, who are we missing? and who isn't included. And, um, you know, at one point I was a little worried about, you know, people who were self-isolating, who were elderly and, you know, you know what was that self-isolation doing to them? So we did kind of a sector check of what was going on. And it was immediately evident that people had already worried about that. They put plans in place. There were lots of organizations reaching out, having conversations. And I think that, you know, going forward, I want to ensure that we continue that kindness, we continue that reaching out, and that we continue to work together um, going forward, except for those Bomber fans. We won't be working very closely with them. So, but thank you very much, everybody. This has been a great, great conversation. Thank you so much, Pamela. Rebecca, you got about a minute uh, to share any final thoughts you have with our uh, viewers. Perfect. I was, yeah, just going to touch on Todd's question about that, um, 
how to have that daily work life and anxiety and stuff. And I found I, it was about probably a month I was going straight. I was so accessible. I was responding to everything on social media, emails, all that stuff, like trying to get it done within minutes. And then it was just, you know, you break down at one second. And then I was like, no, this is, this isn't, this is a long, this is a marathon. This isn't the sprint. And so do I have to get back to this person within five minutes or can I take one hour to recharge? And I was making sure that I was getting out for my walk and listening to a podcast that had nothing to do with COVID. And then also just kind of encouraging my, my colleagues to, to do the same and, and kicking out the SAO or the CAO to be like, Hey, you know, take that hour, you'll recharge, you'll make better decisions, you'll make faster yeah. decisions. Um, so, you know, uh, take that time, figure out what it is that energizes you and, and recognize what drains you. And, um, but you got to have that quick self-reflection to make sure you can, can last because it's, it's going to be a while. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. And I want to just give all of my love to this amazing superstar panel. Um, thank you all for the amazing work you're doing across the prairies in the north. Um, let's keep going. And uh, the next 100 days, let's go kick some butt, change these systems for the better, and make sure we're taking care of all of our relatives. Thank you, Canadian Urban Institute, for bringing us all together. And thank you to everybody for watching. My name is Michael Redhead Champagne. These are the awesomest panelists uh, in the prairies in the north. We're excited to be a part of your world. And uh, let's change these systems together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Care.